Thank you. We'll turn now to our next item of business, which is topical questions. And the first question is from Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report on the fact-finding visit to the UK by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights and how this will inform its plan to tackle child poverty in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. For anyone who reads Professor Philip Alston's interim report, its conclusions are clear. It is a devastating critique of the UK government's economic and welfare policies, which are causing, and I quote, misery. The rapporteur makes multiple recommendations for what the UK government could do differently, including urgently changing universal credit to make it fit for purpose, end the benefits freeze, and scrap the two-child limit and the appalling rape clause. The Scottish Government have also consistently requested UK ministers to take these actions and will continue to press the UK to change course. I welcome the rapporteur's references to the very different approach being taken by the Scottish Government, specifically highlighting the establishment of a social security system guided by evidence and the principles of dignity, fairness and respect, recognising we are mitigating the worst of the UK Government welfare cuts and describing our plans for tackling child poverty as ambitious. Going forward, we'll build on the work of the member when she was Community Secretary and deliver in full on the ambitions she set out in the Child Poverty Scotland Act. Angela Constance. Thank you. The UN Special Rapporteur said that despite the UK being one of the world's richest countries, we have staggering levels of rising child poverty. And he called on UK ministers to open their eyes, although Amber Rudd has confirmed the UK government's ongoing state of denial. So given that this parliament united to pass legislation to end child poverty in the knowledge of the powers we have and of the powers we don't have, how will the cabinet secretary take forward the child poverty delivery plan and specifically the crucial components of affordable housing, the new income supplement and the tailored employment support programme? Cabinet secretary. Uh, thank you. Uh, Amber Rudd's comments yesterday were disappointing. They seem to dismiss this report and characterise the language of Professor Alston as political in nature. In dismissing this report, though, they dismiss the consequences of the actions that they have taken, causing great misery to the most vulnerable. The UK government needs to open their eyes and, quite frankly, lift their heads from the sand. Child poverty is still too high and the finger of blame should point squarely at the UK government and welfare cuts. And while we will work to do all we can with the powers that we have, often with a hand tied behind our back, we will continue our work on the development of the income supplement, a complex undertaking, and we want to ensure that this work meets our two key principles, that it reaches the greatest number of children living in poverty and that it tops up the income sufficiently to lift those families out of poverty. We're also on track to deliver our ambitious programme of 50,000 uh, affordable homes, including 35,000 for social rent. And since 2007, we have delivered over 78,000 affordable homes. And we've begun work on the £12 million programme of intensive employment support. An update on all of those actions will be provided to Parliament by June of next year. Angela Constance. Thank you. Professor Alston also said that resources were available to the Treasury at the last budget that could have transformed the situation of millions of people living in poverty, but the political choice was made to find tax cuts for the wealthy instead. And he also said that it is outrageous that devolved administrations have to spend resources to shield people from UK government policies. So given that this Parliament does not accept that poverty is inevitable, what choices will this government make, by contrast, to ensure that ending child poverty is core to our forthcoming budget? And given that any mitigation needs to be affordable and sustainable, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to working with Parliament to ensure that we continue to work together to end child poverty in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Well, we are very clear that the UK budget could have ended the benefits freeze. The UK government could have chosen to gift a better future for children across these aisles, but they chose not to. Instead, they decided and they prioritised tax cuts for the better off, showing an utter disregard for the most vulnerable, and the Tories, I think, should be utterly ashamed of that. But we can't sit back, and that is why we currently spend this year £125 million in mitigating and mopping up the mess from the ideologically driven cuts of the UK government. 
But mitigating everything is unsustainable, as the member pointed out. The scale of the cut, a 3.7 billion reduction in welfare spending, is the combined total of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Lothian's budget. So I want to use our resources and our powers to create a fairer, a fairer and more equal country, not just mitigate the actions of another government. And I certainly look forward to working with uh, Angela Constance and other members across the parliament to do just that. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The special reporter uh, noted that the concept of universal credit in simplifying benefits, smoothing work incentives, and providing more skills training are, and I quote, in many respects, admirable. Can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government policy remains that, in principle, we should simplify benefits and ensure that there's no cliff edge in benefit levels? He also called the system universal discredit. I think the member should, uh, remind, he should be reminded. Um, now we are clear that we have made many representations to the UK government asking them to halt the rollout, to, to, to listen to the views of this uh, parliament that has outlined and articulated the consequences, the dire consequences of universal credit and the way it has been handled. Uh, the UK government could have, as I said to Angela Constance, taken a different path at the UK government, uh, the UK budget, but they chose not to. Instead, they prioritised tax cuts for the better off. Those are not the priorities of this government. We'll continue to work hard to make sure that we can create a better future for children in Scotland. Elaine Smith, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, President Officer. And despite the previous question, I'm sure that many of us in this chamber will agree that this uh, UN report is a damning indictment on the Tories' cruel and ideological approach to welfare and poverty. But will the Cabinet Secretary also recognise that cuts to local authority budgets are having an impact here in Scotland as well as in England? And whilst welcoming the report's acknowledgement of some of the good work being done by this Parliament, does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that it has been a year since the Child Poverty Bill was passed, but the Government still hasn't brought forward its proposed income supplement? And with one in four Scottish children still living in poverty, will she now reconsider that there's a pressing need and accept Scottish Labour's proposal for quick action by topping up child benefit by £5 a week to lift 30,000 children out of poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Again, I agree with much of what uh, Elaine Smith uh, set out in terms of the report and its damning critique of the UK government. As I outlined to uh, Angela Coins, though, we are uh, undertaking and currently working on the development of an income supplement because the analysis that we had around the top up showed and proved that actually we could use that resource and deploy that resource in a better way to lift more families out of poverty. It is a complex undertaking. I'll continue to engage with her as I think I pledged to do so with uh, her colleague Alec Rowley on that work. Uh, we're also, we have begun work on the £12 million programme of intensive employment support. That again is directly wanting to help parents on low incomes to move into work and progress their careers when already in work. And the first delivery projects will commence on that next year. So we're taking robust action. We're, con we're spending 125 million on mitigation uh, and we'll continue to work with others uh, across the parliament to make sure that where we need to do more we can do more in a collaborative uh, fashion. Patrick Harvey. Thank you presiding officer. The UK government's contempt for this report is emblematic of the contempt that they've shown for the lives of the people affected by the issues that the report covers but while we should all be uh, pleased that the, the report recognises the distinctive approach that's being taken in Scotland. Uh, I'm sure the Minister agrees that we should never be complacent. So can I ask uh, how the Government responds to the section uh, regarding the Scottish Welfare Fund which says it is clear to me that there is still a real accountability gap which should be addressed. The absence of a legal remedy or ro more robust reference to international standards in the Social Security Scotland Act is, uh, is significant and should be addressed. Uh, how does the, the Scottish Government respond uh, to that aspect of the report? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, and uh, again, I thank the, uh, Patrick Harvey for his interest uh, on that. Of course, we take all of the uh, recommendations and actions that the Professor Alston set out with the utmost of seriousness, and I, of course, agree with his critique of what the UK Government have been taking forward and we'll take on board the issues that he raised. However, nowhere is the Scottish Government commitment to human rights more evident than in our work to create that new social security system for Scotland. Section 1 of the Social Security Act establishes the human right to social security as a founding ideal of the system, and it goes further than Article 9 of the International Covenant of Economic and Social Cultural Rights. There is also a strong parliamentary accountability 
responsibility for the delivery of uh, the charter, the social security charter to accompany uh, this uh, and in relation to justiciable, justiciability of human rights we require a properly thought through Scotland wide approach that's why the First Minister established the advisory group on human rights leadership led by Professor Alan Miller and we look forward to considering the group's recommendations so in amongst all of that we take his uh, Professor Alston's uh, recommendations seriously but we have a, a good uh, a platform to build on around making sure that we can uh, evidence to him that we're taking uh, forward the work that he says we need to do more uh, effort on. Thank you very much. We turn to question two, John Finney. Hey, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on mechanical dredging of kelp by uh, mechanical harvesting of kelp by dredging, please. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna uh, Of course, this is an issue I'd expect you to deal with at tomorrow's stage three in the Crown Estate Bill. Currently, the mechanical harvesting of kelp from the seabed by a vessel or vehicle requires a marine licence. Through the marine licensing process, the Scottish Government is committed to protecting the environment and to the National Marine Plan, which sets a presumption in favour of development that is sustainable. We recognise that kelp is an important part of our marine biodiversity, and having considered amendments to the Crown Estate Bill, we intend to support Mark Ruskell's amendment, although there are some clarifications and qualifications that require to be made. John Finney. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there has been much correspondence about this, and some of which I have attained under the Freedom of Information. Um, one such piece is a, a letter from Marine Scotland to the company dated July 2017, in which they talk about the innovative proposal, I quote there. Uh, they, they note that, and again I quote, already received strong support from Scotland Economic Development Agencies, quoting again, ready to provide further assistance as you take the project forward. Again, quoting, I would like to assure you that Marine Scotland is keen to take this sort of initiative. Um, this is a priority issue. I look forward to seeing it develop. Cabinet Secretary, how can the promoter of a policy also be the regulator? And can you indicate, Cabinet Secretary, how po public can have confidence that Marine Scotland would act with impartiality, please? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I think the, uh, uh, the Chamber would probably want to welcome the fact that the Scottish Government and uh, throughout its, the agencies uh, are looking at new innovative industries, thinking about the new technologies, thinking about the, uh, uh, the, the new things that might be able to be developed in the future of Scotland. All governments will be doing that. All governments will be trying to ensure that within the confines that they may have set down about uh, environmental sustainability, which are uh, uh, clearly part of what we're trying to do, uh, that that is something that we would wish to uh, assist forward. Um, and uh, I would have anticipated that almost any government would be in the same position. John Finney. Um, thank you, President. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary again. But, the Cabinet Secretary, if uh, environmental considerations, which w were at the heart of driving Scottish government thinking, you would have already banned this process. Um, so, uh, statements like you've made and indeed the correspondence we've seen leave open to question who's actually in charge. So, can Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm whether it is yourself or the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy that is pushing the dredging agenda inside government? Because there are 500 businesses who are opposed to it. And these are businesses in my constituency which are vitally requiring in a pristine uh, environment. People like the uh, Fishermen's Association. Marine protection is vital, and we've seen already with ship to ship a very casual approach from the Scottish Government. Who's in charge, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say that nobody's pushing any agenda? What we're all trying to do is to ensure that Scotland does have new industries going forward, that innovative technologies are considered very carefully, um, and, uh, and that's the basis uh, on, on which we are doing this. Now, I've already indicated. Uh, that I will be supporting Mark Ruskell's uh, amendments tomorrow. I'm very grateful for the engagement that Mark Ruskell has undertaken with me on this, his, his, his care uh, and his thinking about some aspects of this, which are uh, not without some issues that will still need to be uh, resolved. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that the process that we're currently in is the best way uh, that anybody could imagine uh, thinking about any new industry going forward. Uh, the licensing process itself is about bottoming out the environmental issues that are, are, uh, are required to be considered. Um, and, and I would hope that everybody in this chamber did support uh, the notion that new industries uh, should be looked at, should be considered, uh, and that they should be considered carefully. Bill Kidd. 
Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, for clarification, can the Cabinet Secretary explain what activities will and will not be covered by the proposed actions she has outlined this afternoon? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are one or two things uh, that I think that probably for people to understand the complexities of this, that um, it, it is our uh, view that commercial use, which is the, uh, the phraseology used uh, in the amendment, should not extend to power stations or commercial ports or other similar public infrastructure being prevented uh, from removing kelp species for maintenance or for other public interest reasons, and nor should it prevent appropriate research and development. Um, uh, removals shouldn't be prevented where the activity is hand cutting, which SNH have advised is sustainable. Uh, and I can say to the Chamber that I will consider the need for guidance or, or, or directions to managers uh, on these issues. And I will be announcing, I need to keep something to say tomorrow as well, <laughs> I, I will be announcing a review of the reg regulatory regime of all kelp harvesting activity uh, up to and including farming. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement to, today of support of uh, Mark Ruskell's uh, amendment, supported by myself and Alex Rowley. Um, kelp forests are indeed a priority marine feature and play a vital part in sequestering carbon and protecting our coastlines from erosion, feeding grounds for endangered seabirds and providing a habitat for a wide and diverse range of species, including juvenile fish. And this is very important in relation to them being, as, as I would describe it, perhaps a cradle um, for existing sustainable uh, uh, industries. So um, it, it, I, I just asked the Cabinet Secretary if these issues will be taken into account um, in relation to any, any future deliberations that um, the Scottish Government will take on this very important issue. Cabinet Secretary. Indeed, have been taken into account even during the, any licensing process, which there is not one at the, uh, at the current point. Um, and these are uh, all things that I will be looking at or expecting to be looked at with any review of the regime uh, for kelp harvesting activity right across the board, for which uh, um, uh, I think members ought to be aware that uh, there are five different ways of harvesting kelp. Um, uh, it is a rather more complex uh, and diverse industry which is currently ongoing in Scotland and there's a lot of commercial activity already ongoing in Scotland uh, and we don't want to disincentivise that.